When I first heard about Quibi, I thought it sounded like a dumb idea. And if this poor excuse for a beard that I've been trying to grow over the course of this pandemic is any indication, I know a thing or two about bad ideas. The only difference being that when I have a bad idea, nobody gives me a billion dollars to execute on it. Anyway, after a few days of hearing almost nothing about Quibi online, I decided I'd finally download it and check it out, and it's not great. When you go on their website, you'll see them talk about quick bites everywhere. That's what they call their little short form episodes and what led to the name Quibi. And I would just like to go on record and say that I think Quibi is a dumb name. What a quick bite really is, is when you take a regular episode of TV and cut that into three or four parts and release those parts once per day. Easily the best part about Quibi is that they serve you an ad before each video, which might not seem like that big of a deal until you realize that after your free trial expires, you're going to be paying $5 a month for the opportunity for them to serve you ads. My favorite feature of the app is when you click on the information button next to the ad supported subscription option and it tells you, don't worry, we're not going to interrupt your videos with ads. They're only going to come before the videos. Oh wow, so you're telling me that I can watch an episode of TV and every five to 10 minutes you're going to interrupt it with an ad? You're really changing the game here, Quibi revolutionary. They seem to be fully bought into the idea that people today are mindless zombies with attention spans rivaling people who are supposed to hold politicians accountable so they can only handle five to ten minutes of content at a time. And I have no data to support or refute that theory, but I'm pretty sure Netflix just definitively showed us that if you have high enough quality content that I will sit in front of my TV and watch all seven episodes of your documentary series without even considering diverting my attention. Most surprisingly to me was that Quibi isn't some Silicon Valley startup that's trying to frictionlessly disrupt the streaming service. This is actually the newest venture of media proprietor Jeffrey Kratzenberg, who you might know for being chairman of a little indie company called Walt Disney Studios before leaving to found DreamWorks Animation. Quibi is only available as an app, which is super annoying, but there are a few unique technical features that I think are worth mentioning. What is Quibi? Couldn't tell ya. The first one seems to be the one that they're promoting the most, which is how you can watch any of their content in any conceivable orientation you could possibly put your phone in. All right, it's not really that impressive, but basically you can watch anything in their catalog either horizontally, like an adult, or vertically, like a sociopath. And I'm honestly not sure why one, this is even an option, or two, why they're so proud of it. Vertical video in general makes me want to vomit with few exceptions. One of those exceptions is Snapchat. Obviously, if I'm sending my friend a quick video, I'm not going to hold my phone horizontally since the entire app is designed to be held and used vertically. Even all the Snapchat originals that they make and I ignore on the stories page are all vertical, but they make those with that in mind, so some of them actually still look good. I'll get back to that idea in a minute, but first let's look at the groundbreaking technology that Quibi is promoting. The way they were promoting this, I was expecting something new and exciting, but really they're just doing something called pan and scan. If you're not familiar with that term, basically it's a technique for narrowing the aspect ratio of a widescreen movie to fit the square shape of a television screen by continuously selecting the portion of the original picture with the most significance, rather than just the middle portion. Or simply, it's when you want to make something that looks good look not as good. When this technique was created, it actually solved an issue when most people's TVs in their houses had a 4x3 aspect ratio. But now that we're in 2020 and everyone's phones can show 16x9 or 2.39x1 video with room to spare, this doesn't solve anything. And that's not to say that Quibi couldn't make good vertical content. When I was checking out a few of the shows, I clicked on NBC's news show and it was just bad. Content aside, the editing was so distractingly bad that I actually thought there was something wrong with the app, and that didn't change depending on the orientation. I then watched NBC's news show on Snapchat just to compare the two, and the one on Snapchat is way better. Again, it can only be viewed vertically, but the editing was just better overall and better for the purposes of being a vertical video. I still managed to make it look purposeful and maximize all the space even given the constraints of it being vertical. It's possible that Quibi could do something similar if they're really trying to push this vertical video thing, even though I really hope they don't. And so far, everything I've watched on the app just looks worse held vertically compared to horizontally. I mean, just imagine trying to watch something as epic as Avengers Endgame using Quibi's pan and scan vertical nonsense. Let's kill him properly this time. Another gimmick they seem to be really proud of is around Steven Spielberg's After Dark show, where episodes are only available after sunset. Sup guys, editor Jeremy here. Just wanted to mention that since recording, I have found out that that Spielberg After Dark show isn't even available on Quibi yet. 
even though all the articles that were written six months ago said it was going to launch with the service. As far as I can tell, it doesn't even exist at all at this point. So I just figured I'd mention that real quick. It doesn't really change any of the criticisms I had around the gimmick of the show as it's purported to come out, but figured I'd include that since I just found out about it, and I'll send it back to you, past Jeremy. Now I can see how someone could pitch this, like, let's have a horror show on our platform that's only available at night, and people think that's a good idea. I mean, even I think that sounds like a pretty cool idea, but in execution, I don't think it holds up. For one, I didn't even know the show existed when I was going through the app because I was looking at it in the afternoon, and it wasn't until much later when I was doing some research that I actually found out the show even existed. So I imagine there's some percentage of people who looked at the app once during the day, had no idea the show ever existed, and never will. And second, if this show is good enough that it convinces someone that they would like to pay Quibi $5 a month for the subscription, it then seems silly to hold that content from a paying subscriber for most of their waking hours. The final thing I'll mention on the tech side is something I wasn't even aware of until subscribing to Quibi. On an iPhone, apparently Quibi uses Apple subscriptions to handle how people subscribe to them, which then ties everything to your Apple account, and they process your payments through Apple Pay, and I probably sold my firstborn to work at an Apple store as an indentured servant or something. It's all confusing and stupid and even potentially shady. So after you do the normal sign-up stuff, email, password, all that, you then have to pick which subscription tier you'd like to join. And then from there, you'll see a pop-up that says, would you like to cancel email notifications when your subscription renews? So if I'm understanding this correctly, they're trying to get you to cancel this email so that they don't warn you when the subscription renews in 90 days, and it just starts charging your card until you finally realize you've been funding Shrek 5 for the last six months. And I'm not totally sure if it's Quibi doing this, or Apple doing this, or both of them together doing this, but in any case, it seems pretty deceptive to try to trick people into letting their free trial lapse into a paid subscription without them knowing. That's enough complaining about the technical side of the app. Let's look at the content that they claim is worth $5 a month. I've got Quibi and I need to go to the hospital right now. There's no shortage of big celebrities whose names and faces they bombard you with when you open the app. Chrissy Teigen, Sophie Turner, Liam Hemsworth, LeBron James. And while there may be a lot of big stars in front of the camera, it doesn't seem to be the case behind the camera. Other than Spielberg, there's not a lot of writers or directors that they're really promoting, probably because you've never heard of any of the writers or directors that they've hired. That being said, I did watch a few shows, and I'd like to talk about two of them. The first one is Survive, or as most people will likely call it, the one with Sophie Turner in it. This is described as a tense drama, and at the time of recording, I've seen four episodes for a total runtime of one episode. This show does not start well, and honestly, I don't know how it could. When you're writing a drama, you want to explain the premise, introduce characters, and keep it entertaining enough that people will want to come back for a second episode. Maybe leave it on a cliffhanger or a twist ending of some sort. But when your first episode is only eight minutes long, that's a lot to ask for. The solution the writers seemed to settle on was to barely explain the premise, introduce all the characters in about 30 seconds like you're speed dating them, and just have Sophie Turner exposit via narration for 80% of the episode. I've never been good at lying. I've always been proud of that, but letting her in on my plans would make her an accomplice and she could never carry that. My theory that this was just a regular 40 minute episode and then they cut it up into these little 8 to 10 minute chunks seems to hold up because after episode 4 it seems like where you would normally end a pilot. By this point the main characters in conflict have been introduced and there's a pretty dramatic ending that would leave you wanting more if this were a better written show on any other platform. My favorite episode is definitely episode 2 because it ends so abruptly that it couldn't possibly have been intentional and when I looked at the runtime it's 9 minutes and 59 seconds. Sorry, the better question is, what are you doing in here? This is a man's room. So they couldn't even let it run one second longer because of this arbitrary maximum time they've set themselves. The other show I want to mention is Murder House Flip. And on paper, it's the single greatest concept for a TV show I've ever heard. Basically, it's like an HGTV house flipping show, but all the houses are the sites of terrible murders. We'd actually been looking at quite a few homes and... The house next door was for sale and we didn't like it, but we liked the looks of this one. It's almost impossible to believe what happened here. I'm Tom Williams. I'm Barbara Holmes and we live in a murder house. 
seven people murdered by a little old lady. Their bodies buried in the backyard. But every house deserves a second chance. Murder and makeover don't usually go together, but now that's all going to change. So the episode starts out like a true crime series. They kind of go over the murder and how it happened in the house, and they're interviewing the current residents of the house, and it's all super entertaining. And then the hosts come in, and it's their job to kind of give the house a makeover. I think it's a genius idea, and if you told this idea to any Midwestern housewife, they'd have their checkbook out before you could finish your sentence. But even a rock-solid idea like this can only hold up so well to being quibified. My biggest complaint when watching it was that it wasn't on some network like HGTV. I can only imagine how well it would do on some other platform, so we can only hope that when Quibi tanks, they sell the rights to that show. Quibi is my absolute favorite snack. So yeah, those are my thoughts on Quibi. In short, I don't like it. But that being said, I'm not rooting against it. At least they're trying something different, even if different doesn't mean better. I think they could possibly have something good on their hands. My only suggestion would be to completely rebrand, get rid of your favorite feature, stop giving people ads if they're already paying for the service, and sell the rights to Murder House Flip. But if you do all that, I think you're golden. Hopefully you found that video more entertaining than I found anything on Quibi. If you liked it, why not check out this video over here where I talk about all those lame streaming services that only have horizontal videos.